Um, how many of you believe that life can be confusing? Anybody? Okay. How many believe sometimes Scripture can be confusing? Anybody? All right. Yep. Sometimes we as humans have weird ways of putting things together or trying to explain things, and sometimes we don't make it better. Sometimes we make it confusing. Uh, then they came up with this word. It's actually two words in the Greek that have come together. It's called an oxymoron. Anybody know what an oxymoron Anybody know any oxymorons? <laughs> don't, don't point to each other, okay? Please don't do that. Um, actually, the Greek words that come together for that means sharp, dull. And so that, they, that it's a sharp, dull. It just means seemingly words that don't go together and sometimes can be confusing. Sometimes there's uh, a bit of irony involved, and we can ask questions like, how many of you have heard this one before? Why do we park on driveways? and drive on parkways. You, you, doesn't that seem strange? Isn't that weird? It's like we drive on parkways and park on driveways. I don't, I don't know why we do that. Uh, why do we put suits in garment bags and garments in suitcases? Does that seem strange? I mean, like, okay, you're with me on this. So you, you, these turns of phrases, um, why are they called tugboats if they push the barge? Shouldn't they call be push boats? I mean, you know, just sometimes, you know, things don't always make sense for us. Um, sometimes we have some of these words that we put together um, that are very confusing, like lead balloon. <laughs> so far, this has gone over like a lead balloon. Lead balloons don't fly. They don't go very well, but we put those two words together. How many of you have ever been on a working vacation? Like, right? Is that not an oxymoron? Either you're working or it's a vacation. There is no such thing as a working vacation. How many of you have seen something that was so ugly, it was pretty ugly? I, it's either pretty or it's ugly. Can it really be pretty and ugly all at the same time? Unless you have certain puppies, then maybe they are. Uh, but pretty ugly. And then, of course, the silly one is jumbo shrimp. I mean, either it's jumbo, which means large, or it's a shrimp, which means small. So can you really have a jumbo shrimp? And then I'm going to add one more that's not so funny, and that is the Christian center. Ooh, okay. Yeah, suddenly the grins and laughs and just kind of got serious in here. And, um, and some of these are seriously funny. Do you, do you get that one? Okay, all right. But the idea. Now, for a passage today, I can see what Paul is doing. And as a pastor, I can feel for him. Because there's sometimes, and believe it or not, the lights are bright enough for me to see you. I can see you. I can see your faces. I can see when you're looking at your, your watches, like, how long is this thing going to go on? I can see whether the lights are coming on or we're like, you know, lights are on, but nobody's home. There's nothing that's going on there. And there are times, I admit as a pastor, that I'm trying to think through not only what I'm saying, but I'm trying to think through a better way of saying it. It's like, this isn't working. Um, in, the, uh, in the black churches, they will say things like, preach on, brother, preach on. Preach on means we didn't get it the first time, and you better, you know, just say it again. You got to say it in some kind of different way. And so I've had this kind of struggle as I'm preaching to really kind of communicate. That's why we as pastors, we depend on the Holy Spirit. So when sometimes afterwards, uh, some of you come up and say, I wish you would stop preaching at me, you know, like, or have you been in my closet? Have you been paying attention? Because this is exactly where I am, and that's where I'm instructed. Like, no, that's the Holy Spirit. And yes, he is no, I, I, that sounds weird. He is in your closet, but come out of the closet. No, I, it, you know, but he is there. He, he knows everything about you, and he will allow connections to be made. Sometimes I'll say, uh, people will say to me, they'll say things like, you know, wow, when you said that, and I'll think back and say, I don't think I said that, but that's the connection that they got, and that's the Holy Spirit. So we give room for the Holy Spirit. Now, in our passage today, always remember context 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 so when i give you a little passage that means read all the passages around it before it after because it all makes sense let scripture interpret scripture but in, at the end of chapter five the apostle paul basically says that sin 
covers or, or that grace covers sin. And even if you have great sins, let me see a show of hands. How many of you had great sin? No, no. All right, some of you is like, yeah, I'll go there. Like, yeah, the, it's me. You know, I'm not, yeah, I'm the one. But it says, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter how big your sins are, that grace covers it. And then they say that, anybody ever done shadow boxing before? You know, it's kind of like, yeah, there's a fake op uh, opponent, right? You're, you're, you're shadowing uh, against a wall. And it says that when Paul was writing this, he's almost shadow boxing with an unseen opponent. And what he's doing, he's been around the block enough times to go, I know what you're going to say, and I'm not, I know what you're going to miss here, and I know how you're going to take it and twist it and turn it into mean something else. And so when he just finished this about saying grace covers even great sin, and when there's more sin, there's even more grace. And then he begins to ask in verse or chapter 6 a rhetorical question, which means doesn't require an answer from you because then he's going to give you the answer uh, as well. So let's take a look at Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 11. So remember, we had just finished up in 5 with, you know, great sin and, and grace covers great sin. All right? Verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Everybody say new life. That's the whole point of the sermon today is that we have a new life through Jesus Christ. Verse 5, if we have been united with him like this in death, we will with him, we will be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In that same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, so I, I've already given it to you. I've, I've told you the whole point of this whole message is that we have new lives. The old life, the old self has been crucified, and we have a new life, an improved life, eternal life through Jesus Christ. So let's go back to the, the beginning there. When Paul asked that rhetorical question, should we keep on sinning? And then he basically answers in our vernacular today, not just no right? He says, no way. We, we, we can't continue to do that. And that actually discredits the work and the grace of Christ if we continue to wallow in sin that he died for that we might be free from it. If we are truly saved, we cannot keep sinning. Now, we're going to talk about that for a little bit because I know there's some of you who said, I've been a Christian a long time, and I happen to know, yes, we can. All right? There's going to be a difference with that, so we'll, we'll talk about that. But how many of you, when you were kids, or maybe when your kids were kids, just loved to get dirty? I mean, anybody did? Anybody love to get dirty when you were a kid? This is not working. This is going over like a lead balloon. <laughs> I, when I was a kid, and I'm still a kid, I'm just an older kid and an achy kid, but I'm still a kid at heart, and I love to be outside. By the way, Charlie, thank you. I saw that hand back there, all right? But I love to go and run and play. What do sweaty little boys do but get sweaty and dirty, and they come home, and how many of you have had the bathtub ring, right? Because you put the kid in the tub, and there's soap, and there's scum, and it just builds up, and you're going... Ugh, right? When you're little, 
I would do everything I could to not have to take a bath. A lot of kids don't like to take a bath. They don't mind being dirty. It's mamas that mind kids being dirty and say, you got to take a bath. You got to get clean. But I will tell you, there became a point in my life that mama didn't have to take a, tell me to take a bath. And in fact, my, my brother actually went the other way. He took several baths a day. He, you know, he was just, anything that got grosser, man, he was going to shower. He was going to be in there. And when we become more mature, then we can't stand to be dirty. Anybody ever been so tired at night and you usually shower at night and you just think, you know what, it's Friday night. I don't have to get up in the morning. I'm just going to bed. I have been there. I have done that. And I have woken up at 2 a.m. and going, Ugh, and got up and went to take a shower because I couldn't stand. I can't relax I, if I'm still dirty. We want to be clean. When we're immature in Christ, we don't mind dirtying ourselves up with our sinful behaviors. In fact, we're just like everybody else, and we think it's cool. We think it's fun. But then we get this new life that's being offered through Jesus Christ and we begin to realize how dirty we actually were. And the things that we thought were fun and exciting, we now kind of go, ugh, how could I once do that? How could I believe in that? How could I think that? How could I do those kinds of things? If we are truly saved, then we cannot keep sinning anymore all right number two knowledge is power paul seems to even chastise them for even thinking about it he's writing a letter he doesn't know what they're going to say but he knows what they're going to say and he's like how dare you even ask the question because he you know some smart alex going to ask that question it's like well wait a minute <laughs> if there's more sin and there's more grace because there's more sin then maybe we can have our cake and eat it too. Maybe, maybe we can just keep right on sinning so God's grace can come even more. And he says the answer is no. But he says this, don't you know? Don't you know? He's like, don't you know that when you were baptized in Christ, how many of you have been baptized? How many of you got sprinkled? How many of you got dunked till you're bubbled? All right, yeah. It really doesn't matter about how much water, but when we are baptized into Christ, we use water as a symbol, which is why it doesn't matter how much it is, because it's an outward sign of an inward grace. It's what Christ is doing. We actually, unless it's infant baptism, we're doing believer's baptism, we don't get baptized until we've made a profession of faith. When we make a profession of faith, then we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And then through obedience, we go through the sacrament of holy baptism and we can be washed clean. He says, don't you know that all who are baptized in Christ were baptized in death? Now, let me just use full immersion, dunk them till you bubble uh, as an illustration. So, I do like that. Uh, certainly, it's appropriate for anybody regardless of age. Some of you didn't want to come out to the beach last year. I get it. It's polluted water, but you know what? It's Christ, so he cleans everything, all right? But with immersion... What you're doing is going down. You're going down completely under the water, and it's a symbol of death. We're saying goodbye to the old. And when we come up, we come up with that first fresh breath. Some of you we held a little longer under there because we wanted you to really appreciate what Christ has done for you but when you come up you come up and get that first fresh breath of air and you are washed clean in Jesus Christ from the inside out when you are baptized into Christ's death you are dead turn to your neighbor and say you look dead alright you, you look dead now 
Now, here's, the other, here's another word for you today. I love etymology to find out where words come from. Uh, double entendre. They say it actually comes from French words that have no meaning anymore, but originally it meant having a double meaning, a double entendre of something that has two different meanings with it. And so Paul is going back and forth with these words of death and resurrection and he's talking about the physical death of Christ and when we die with Christ it is a spiritual death to the old man and that's actually what Paul calls the old self the old man the old self we're dying to our old way of life when we are invited to a life of Christ then we are invited to crucify the flesh die to the flesh die to ourselves die to the things that we wanted once that were worldly kinds of things and to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior he says even as Jesus was resurrected and yes he was resurrected physically we are resurrected spiritually with him and one day later we will be resurrected physically with him but right now for me it's important that you understand the spiritual resurrection because that's what baptism is it, 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 it's an example of the spiritual life the new life your resurrection coming back to life you went down in your sin you went down in death but you rose to life you rose to new life knowledge is power when we know that we are in Christ, sin no longer has power over us. Turn to your neighbor and say, I got the power. <laughs> okay, we got one. Thank you, Bridget, for playing around. All right, also. All right, thank you for that. You know, we got the power. And what that means are that there's no excuses. Because we have the power in Jesus Christ, we don't have to live in sin anymore. Um, the third thing I want you to think about is yes. Sin is always crouching at the door. Anybody ever heard that one before? Anybody ever read that one before? Sin is always there. Now, actually, I know that verse very well. What I actually surprised myself is, because sometimes I actually have to look things up as well, and it goes all the way back um, uh, to Genesis. Well, let me, let me do this one first. Um, in Romans 7, 15, Paul admits the, the struggle of every Christian. So when we say, you know, we're, we're in Christ, and if you're in Christ, you cannot keep on sinning. It doesn't mean that we don't sin. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And yes, as long as we are in this fallen world and we are in fallen bodies, then we're going to struggle with sin. And, and so in, in Romans 7, 15, Paul admits the struggle of every Christian. He says, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but I hate what I do. Why do I do the things that I don't want to do? The things that I want to do, I don't do. Every Christian has probably been there. It's like, ah! Who's going to save me from this body of mine? You know, bad body. Why are you doing those things? What are those natural things? And why are those things in there? Out with the old, in with the new. But you need to know. And so that this one about um, uh, that sin is crossing the door comes from Genesis. You don't have to read very far to get to this one. Genesis means in the beginning. It's the first book of the Bible. If you've ever just opened up a Bible, started reading it in the book of Genesis, here's you're going to find it in chapter 4, verse 7. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Wow. Did you hear that? Sin is always crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Who's the one who's in control? Who's the one who has the power here? You do. You must rule over it. Everybody gets a choice. 
nobody is a victim of your own sin. Do you hear that? Because there's a lot of people who go around whining and moaning that everybody else got everything and I got nothing and everybody else's life is easy and mine is so hard and, well, it's harder for me than it is for you. And it's like, no, it's hard for everybody. <laughs> turn to your neighbor and go, <laughs> right? No, maybe you should just turn to yourself. You're like, like, you know what? everybody it, it says God says he makes it rain on the just and on the unjust and, you know good things come bad things come it happens to everybody God bless you people you're not that special okay just everybody it happens to everybody but you are not a victim you are in control of you when you are in Jesus Christ because you have been baptized into a new life through Jesus Christ and you do not have to give in to the power of sin. You have a choice in the things that you do, the way that you live, the things that you read, the places you go, and it also means you have no excuses. Because don't you know, in Christ, you have power over sin. It no longer rules over you, but you rule, rule over it. Now, can I confess to you that discipline is one of the hardest things? Even the word, it should be a four-letter word. It's so hard. And, and if you've ever been on the diet before, you know, why do I do the things that I don't want to do? And every time you turn around, there's a cupcake, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, there's a temptation around every corner. Uh, Chris and I have been talking about this, and, and we deal with this, and they say, you know, well, it's an anniversary. Well, it's a birthday. Well, it's Tuesday. You know, it just, it just kind of slowly slips away from you. But listen to this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 24 to 27, Paul writes this. Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. What is the prize? The prize is Jesus Christ. The prize is eternal life. The prize is getting to be with him forever run in such a way anybody ever been in a race before did you intentionally go as slow as possible or did you go as fast as possible because you wanted to run the race you wanted to run with perseverance you wanted to run in such a way as to get the prize he says everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training they do it to get a crown that will not last told you a story last week about James Dobson and, and his trophies and several years later somebody found it in the garbage and said oh by the way I thought you might like to have this back he said it's going to happen to all of our trophies the trophies we get here are temporary they're not a big deal they're here today and they're gone tomorrow but he says but they do it to get a crown that will not last but we do it to get a crown that will last forever therefore I do not run like someone running aimlessly have you ever seen somebody who didn't know which way to go in a race and they just kind of ran around Whoa! no direction they just run and it's kind of the picture I get of people in this world, in this life, they don't even know that there's a goal. They don't even know that they're in a race. They're just running. Blah. They, they have no direction. But we who have been called by Christ have been given a focus. We've been given a direction. And we are called not to run aimlessly. And, and Paul writes, I do not fight like a, and, and God bless him, he's mixing metaphors here as well as I do. He writes like I talk. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. That's what shadow boxing is. You're just beating the air. There's nobody really there. He says, I, I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body to make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. All right, so he says a couple of important things here is when you're running, 
for the prize of eternal life in Jesus Christ. You have to be focused. You have to go on to a strict diet. If you've ever heard an athlete talk, they are very careful about what goes into their body. Only things that are good for them. They want every possible advantage. And, and so they eat only the healthy things. They drink only the healthy things because their goal is to win the race. They don't eat all the things that you and I do, um, but they have a single-minded focus. And the ones who are at the top, the ones who win the races have worked hard. They have persevered hard. They have disciplined their bodies. And, and sometimes they've been, they're able to push themselves harder than you and me. And, and they are constantly doing mind games with their body. The body says, I'm tired. I want to quit. I want to stop. And the mind says, no, you're not. Get in line. Feet don't fail me now. Keep moving. We called to keep moving. But here's the thing that scares me. Now, I know preachers feel differently about this, and some of you all might think differently about this. But when I hear this, it, it makes me concerned for me and for everybody else. He says, I, he, he says I, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave that after I have preached to others, he's already a preacher, he's already a teacher, he's already telling them how to live their lives, but if he doesn't go home and live the same life, what's he say here? He said, I'll be disqualified. Ruh row, Rorge. We don't want to be disqualified. How do we get disqualified? but by continuing. And, and, and continuing is the word you need to hold on to. I told you I'd come back to it. Yes, we who are in Christ have power over sin. Yes, every one of us has continued to struggle, and once in a while, we fail. We fall, but we get back up again, and we keep moving forward. We ask for God's grace and forgiveness. What we're talking about here when you're dead to sin, you remember, it's, it's still crouching at the door. As long as you're here, it's going to be around every corner, and it's waiting to pounce if you will just have a moment of weakness and let it in. But the, the important thing here is whether or not you're continuing to live with sin. When you have been washed clean in Jesus Christ, you cannot continue to live with the filth of the worldly kind of things on you. One more illustration. Jet lag. How many of you have ever had jet lag? If you have ever flown, particularly internationally, to another country in a way different time zone, then you have suffered jet lag. Your mind and your body are so confused because they're pulling in different directions because your body thinks it's nighttime and wants to go to bed. And your body, anybody have your body ever tell you what to do? It's like, I'm tired. We have been up all night. That guy next to me, uh, I hope he didn't have the virus because he was snoring all night long. I didn't get a wink of sleep. I'm not caught up. And your mind looks around in the new place you're at and it says, well, it's light outside. I'm not supposed to be tired. But you also know that if you listen to your body and you go lay down, then you never will get right. Can I get an amen? Right? Because your body's telling you what to do. And if you go down and lay, then you're going to sleep when you're supposed to be awake and you're going to be awake when you're supposed to be asleep. But what do you do? You beat your body into submission and you say, no, you're not. You're not tired. I'm not going to bed. We're going to keep going. But listen to this. You will overcome. It's mind over matter. It's mind over your body. And eventually, 
eventually your body will conform to your mind. Do you get this? This is a very powerful illustration and a powerful point because some of us have given into sin and we have this ongoing sin and we say, woe is me, I'm doomed, you know, I'm not running for the prize and, but I'm only human and, and every time I don't want to do it, my body says I want to do it and it's like, tell your body, stop it. Just stop. Some years ago, my, my great-grandfather, 91 years old, I was his driver because my great-grandparents, one was blind and the other one couldn't see. And so he kept his own car because he wanted the power. He wanted the control. And when I came over, I would have to drive him in his ugly green 1970 hand-painted olive green Torino station wagon. Anybody want to testify to their grandparents' cars? Anybody? Remember? Yeah, okay. So one day we could not find Granddaddy and Mimi, and they're gone. And Granddaddy got tired of waiting for somebody to come drive him, and he decided he wanted to go up. We had uh, my uncle, my great uncle, ran a ranch up here in Inverness, and he wanted to get to the ranch, and he didn't want to wait anymore. He wanted to take the reins in his own hand, and he got in it, and he drove, and he got there successfully. Isn't that a great story? Well, it's not over yet. All right. So my uncle says, well, Daddy, what are you doing? He says, well, I wanted to go to the cabin. Years ago, my great-grandfather had built a cabin out in the middle of the woods, and it was for the whole family, and he just wanted to go to the cabin. And he said, all right, Daddy. He says, I'll get in the truck. I'll open all the gates for you. You just follow me, and I'll lead you back. And it was miles through sand and all kind of things that you know, roll over in the ponds and everything else, all kind of dangers. And they're almost to the cabin, and it starts to rain. What little bit of eyesight granddaddy had, he is now lost. And he started driving down the bob wire fence line. Boom, 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 boom. My uncle said he took out 100 yards of bob wire fence. And when he finally got his daddy stopped, and he said, well, son, I couldn't see because the rain started. He says, I know, daddy, but why didn't you just stop? Why didn't you just stop? Some of you are living lives, and you're continuing to sin, and you know it's not right, and you're driving down the barbed wire fence, and it's coming hard and fast over the car. Boom, boom, boom. But you don't think you have power. You don't think you have control. You don't think you get just, why don't you just stop? Just stop. Paul has made it clear. If you are in Christ, not only should you not, you don't have to give in to the power of sin. So what do we do with this? All right, ask God to give you the 91-point inspection. Anybody ever do that with your car where you go in and they, they do all these kind of things? You don't even know what they're doing or if they do them, but you know what? I mean, they're inside, they're outside, they pull up the hood. It does not matter how shiny your car is on the outside if it's not good underneath. And it doesn't matter how good you look to the rest of the world. And I'm going to tell you, you look good, okay? You look like nice people. Some of you have crosses on. I don't have to guess. You say, I'm a Christian. I got all these things on the outside. But what we can't see is what's going on on the inside. And you need to invite God to come in and do that 91-point inspections. You may be the one. You can deceive others, but you might even be deceiving yourself. The God who sees everything will make it clear if you will simply humble yourself and ask him to check you out inside and out. And when he brings a sin to mind, confess it. Confess it means to agree with him and say, yep. Now, many of you have been to AA or you know of AA. It says you are only as sick as your secrets. Sometimes we hold on to our secrets because we think we're doing a great job, but you're really not doing a great job, and it will mess up the rest of your life. You're not doing a great job hiding it from God nor anybody else. You cannot overcome that which you don't acknowledge. And you need to know the God who sees all. There are no secrets. To confess means to agree with. You're not giving God some information that he didn't know. He says, everything that's done in the dark is going to come to light. He already knows. 
He just wants to know that you know. And as long as you hold on to it, as long as you hide it, that secret has power over you. Once we confess it and we give it to God, then we don't have to worry about it anymore. Ask God to give you the power to overcome. That power is there. The power of Jesus Christ is available to any and all who come on his name, who call on his name. And if you call, then he is willing to give you the power that you need through the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome any sin that you might not live in ongoing sin. And then finally, just refocus. You remember when you were learning to ride a bike and your daddy said, don't look at the mailbox? What did you do? You looked at the mailbox, right? You're going to hit whatever you focus on. If you focus on the things of the world, you're going to hit the world. If you focus on Jesus, you're going to have eternal life. I want to share this last bit with you is uh, one of my favorite songs from many, many years ago. It says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. When we turn to Jesus, when we look to Jesus, when we focus on him, we will not be pulled away by any sin that's crouching at the door. The time to be prepared is now, not when that temptation is there. And we can say no to that by focusing on Jesus. We will naturally grow closer to him and then strangely the things of earth will grow strangely dim the things that once were attractive to us are no longer attractive anymore because of Jesus sacrificial love sin has lost its power death has lost its sting and we can live new lives holy lives now and forevermore amen amen let's pray father we thank you for this day